much better use the zero degrees uh, camera. Um, you have to make a good planning and decision making of the case before to go to of the operating room. This is very, 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 very important because uh, I, I, when I, when I was studying the, the technique, uh, all the surgeons uh, with a lot of experience say this is a, a left-handed surgery. You have to hold the camera with the left hand, uh, and this is a uh, this is determinant uh, from the approach. If, uh, if, if you approach a, a left a, a side lesion, it's, it's more easily. But if you approach a right side a lesion, it's a, all in a, a, it's more, a little more complicated. Another challenge that was the detach of the flow ligament. This, uh, if you don't have the instruments, uh, to detach the flavon ligament, they will, well, you can use the, the carison punch, uh, but it is, uh, again, if you, don't, if you don't want, you don't have the correct portal, you don't have the correct access to the spine, you don't have, you don't have the ability to detach the flavon ligament uh, because you don't have the instrument and you don't have the mobility of the instrument inside the spine. The first preoccupation was make a, a dura tear, a tear in the dura with the shaver, because I, I don't have the, the I am the young shavers uh, that I am on the uh, first like, the uh, regular use. You, we use the, the common shavers with using arthroscopy, and we have uh, to. We realize right now that this shaver uh, at seven thousand revolutions uh, make a uh, a good work, and uh, and we solve that. Um, but we don't. Thank God we don't have any kind of lesion of the dura. We don't have to solve this right now, but um, another challenge was visibility because the spine, the spine sometimes the, the vessels uh, uh, around the dura uh, bleeding and without irrigation it's difficult to see. And the, the bone, when you, you make the lam laminectomy, uh, it literally too, and you, we need to do the irrigation pump. Um, don't fall on just the MRI and don't forget the sacroiliac joint. This is a um, sacroiliac joint is a, a, a frequently forgotten uh, cause of pain. And I, I, I always check uh, I always check uh, with an injection of lidocaine in the sacroiliac joint if the patient has or not this uh, condition. I always make this blood test only with the lidocaine. Never, never underestimate the case. Never be uh, enter to the operating room confident about this case is easy. Ne uh, Each case is different for, from another, and each case, and each case need, needs your complete concentration in the case and the, your complete preparation and programmation. Don't be confident about any case. This is a, a policeman uh, of the elite forces. Uh, he has two, two L5, L4, L5, and L5, S1 uh, hernia. The, the majority of the symptoms is right-sided. And this was what I decided to go 
to the uh, the right side. So you can see here in the, I check with the X-ray in the, that we are fluoroscopy, we are in right-sided in the L5-S1 space. You have to check that because you can miss the space and it's very easy to miss. Then we go, uh, this is another patient, but I used to do, to figure the, have to, to be sure be in the space. And this is a, complication this is not this is a um, we are here we are here uh, detaching the the dura and this is the disc removing the disc with the with the pituitary punch We use the same uh, the same portal. We use this, the uh, the retractor retractor to protect the dura, and here is the disc, and then uh, through the the, the same. Portal, I insert the the disc punch and remove the disc. Here, here we are protecting the dura, and we are we are removing the disc. Right side, this is his cephal, caudal, right, and the medial line. So this is another uh, sorry, sir. Well, you see, we are removed the disc and the root and the duress. This is uh, this is a, a, another case. This is a, a, a 50, 50, Right now, it's fifty-eight years. This is a, 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 an architect. This is a, in two twenty. He has a right-sided L five S one herniation. He go to. Uh, you have to do this MRI, uh, you see here, uh, uh, so various discs, this uh, discopathies, but this is the, 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 his major symptoms are L5, L4, and, and the major pain of the, uh, of the, the patient was always uh, in the left side, like this, left side of the leg. He have a, he has a, a weakness, pain. A, he can walk a, more than ten minutes. He can stand. He has long long standing pain, long walking pain, long sitting pain. He can climb stairs. And he went went to surgery in two twenty, but another another surgeon and a, this colleague. 
uh, make a mistake to the to the side of the the microdisectomy. He make a he he was done a, a microdisectomy by microscope and he ended up for uh, you see here the the right side and. He was told that the symptoms that continue, that he continues with the symptoms but in the post-operatively, and he was told that the symptoms are because this uh, dorsal hernia. Uh, I told that this this cannot reduce the, the symptoms of this level, that these are not have a cause, causing symptoms right now. And we go to the operating room and we we make a we will see it here the shaver when I see the, the carousel. And here we're, with this uh, this shaver, we make the the bone resection. Here is the the superior the sap. Here is the caudal. Here is medial. Here is lateral. With, with this patient in particular, uh, I was very uh, careful with the dura because you see the amount of bone, and I I was very careful with the with the here is the ligament, the flavor ligament. I was afraid to make a dura tear with this patient. And this patient in particular, before we enter to the operating room, I make a, a sacroiliac joint test with the pain. And we make first the, the Google technique to decompress the, the stenosis right side. Uh, right side because, excuse me, a left sided and here we are detaching the flavor ligament. So the carries on. And we have right now here the dura. There is some some scars on back in. We can move the with the retractor the, the roots.
we use the radio frequency to control the bleeding. And in the, in the second, in the second, we make we make a fusion of the both sacroiliac joints with these percutaneous screws. And we have uh, many cases of this surgery, and combined with the, the compression, uh, the patient has a relief of all of the symptoms. Yeah, he has also knee pain and all of the symptoms of L4 uh, pain uh, was gone. The weakness was gone. He's walking again. Um, he has no Patrick positive pain. He has no leg, uh, straight leg pain. He can walk uh, and go to the to the his work uh, with, not, uh, with, more, with more morbidity, with more, he, is, he has only one week, two weeks of the surgery. This is um, my, my experience of the, of the cases. Um, uh, if you have any questions, Okay, uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, now um, uh, it's the turn of uh, Dr. Antonio Fondes. He is a surgeon in Switzerland in the Clinic Latour on the Genève University Hospital. The topic of the presentation will be the rationale for navigation in full endoscopy surgery. Hi, this is Antonio Founders from uh, Geneva. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon working at the uh, Latour Hospital. Uh, I'm also consulted at the Geneva University Hospitals. I would like to thank Maxime Chalali and Jean-Charles Lueck for organizing this webinar about endoscopic spine surgery, which is uh, gaining a huge popularity thanks to biportal technique. Uh, I know it's been in use in Asia for many years. And I uh, also would like to thank uh, the sponsor for uh, making uh, this uh, webinar possible. I'm going to talk about the rationale for navigation in full endoscopic uh, spine surgery. First, a little bit of history. Computer-assisted navigation has been developed in the 90s here in Switzerland at the Müller Institute in Bern. One of the first uh, systems was the Medivision system to uh, facilitate pedicle screw insertion. It was uh, quite a difficult process. I remember many hours spent the day before the surgery to uh, define anatomical landmarks that we then had to uh, find again on the patient during the surgery uh, to allow for a matching, and then we could use the navigation. It was efficient, but a difficult process. Today, uh, most of the techniques use passive and uh, uh, active navigation systems, uh, which allow for real-time uh, positioning of uh, the uh, instruments. The uh, computer assisted navigation uh, is very efficient for accuracy. Uh, the first case report describing the insertion of a pedicle screw using navigation was published in 1995. Since then, there's been a huge technological improvement uh, of the current systems. Uh, it allows for a better accuracy uh, of implant positioning, 5% misplacement with uh, the navigation in average versus 15% with uh, fluoroscopic techniques. So it's very useful in uh, minimal invasive fusion because it also allows for uh, less radiation than the CRM conventional fluoroscopic pedicle screw insertion, more than 50% less radiation. In degenerative deformity surgeries or so complex anatomy, uh, the navigation allows for a faster implant uh, positioning. Most of the systems currently used are based on cone beam image acquisition. These are two systems, the Zim 3D on the left, a C-arm that rotates 190 degrees around the patient, 
and the arm that rotates 360 degrees around the patient. Both systems allow for a three-dimensional image reconstruction and real-time navigation for the instruments. The arm uh, is based on a technology that uses uh, more images, so the definition is a little bit better than uh, with the Zim 3D, but still uh, both systems uh, are very good for uh, navigating and inserting pedicure screws. This is the first generation ORAM that we have been using at the University Hospital for many years and we've used it so for pedicure screw insertion but also for complex uh, surgeries like uh, pedicure subtraction osteotomy. It's a, a system that allows for a more accurate angular correction and then you can check after you've done the osteotomy the result of your uh, correction and also the uh, uh, checking of the implant positioning. We've also used it for minimal invasive surgery like x uh, It allows for anatomical localization, incision planning, so a smaller skin incision, and also finding the optimal working channel. Uh, you can check the position of the cage during the surgery. You have less radiation uh, with this uh, navigation system than with the standard uh, C-arm technique for the same surgery, and you can do combined procedure. If your patient is in a lateral position, you can do the anterior or lateral cage insertion with the pedicle screw insertion at the same time uh, by another team. The ORM navigation has been compared to C-arm guidance uh, for pedicle screw placement. This is a study published in 2019 by a Chinese group. It's a systematic review of eight studies, clinical and or cadaveric. The ORM definitely is more accurate for pedicle screw uh, placement, but it is more time consuming versus uh, the uh, C-arm, uh, but uh, it definitely can be improved with a trained OR team. The clear advantages for me of, uh, of uh, computer assisted navigation is the use in complex anatomy, uh, especially if you use uh, pedicle uh, screws or implants, like in the C1, C2 uh, area, the revision cases, pedicle subtraction, osteotomies, but not only. It's a better uh, system for uh, placing pedicle screws. Uh, due to uh, an increased accuracy, uh, reduced radiation exposure, you can do an immediate post-operative, post-procedure check for your implants. And as I said, uh, if you have a trained team, uh, it's faster than the C-arm. I'm completely convinced about this. So it was uh, absolutely obvious for us that we could use it in uh, full endoscopic spine surgery. We started uh, the uh, uh, unilateral biportal endoscopic surgery in our hospital a few uh, months ago. Uh, we uh, used the navigation to check uh, the level in complex and simple cases. Uh, we can check intraoperatively uh, where we are, especially if the camera vision is blurred by uh, bone dust or a bleeding. It's useful in deformity, it's useful in revision surgery, in multiple level endoscopic surgery. And uh, I'm definitely convinced that it improves uh, the learning curve uh, for uh, surgeons who are starting endoscopic surgery. Here is the setup that we have at the uh, uh, Hospital La Tour en Mera. The arm is in place. We do the three dimensional reconstruction and then we can navigate in real time. You see uh, the uh, reference frame uh, inserted in the ear crest of the patient in the lower part of this uh, slide during a uh, biportal endoscopic uh, disc herniation surgery. So the OR navigation in endoscopic surgery for us is an advantage. Uh, it's a, a technique that allows three-dimensional imaging and real-time navigation, incision planning, uh, you can check uh, during your surgery uh, where you are, and you can also do an end of uh, procedure check if necessary. The problems are that it is a quite a bulky uh, machine. Uh, it's also a higher cost for the hospital, also for the insurance. In Switzerland, we build the use of the arm to the insurance. It's not always available. You need additional incision, usually in the iliac crest for inserting the reference frame. You need a trained personnel in the OR, and the patient is still radiated, even if it's uh, less than a C-arm for the same procedure. The alternative uh, to the OR-arm, if it's not available, is the hybrid operating room, uh, like it's been described here by a Japanese group in 2020. Uh, I think that the best alternative is the uh, electromagnetic navigation system. Uh, this has been developed in the years 2000 for pedicle screw guidance as well. There is a reduced radiation exposure for the staff and the patient. 
uh, and it's, uh, um, it uh, enhances the uh, insertion of the pedicure screws. It's at least as good as a standard fluoroscopic uh, guided uh, pedicure screw insertion like it has been shown here uh, by uh, this uh, group phrase uh, colleagues in 2008 uh, where they compared the conventional fluoroscopy cf to electromagnetic uh, uh, navigation system uh, there were less critical breaches with the electromagnetic navigation versus the fluoro guided uh, the first studies were done on uh, cadavers and the thoracic spine by the, the group of SAGI and published in uh, 2003 uh, in spine. Uh, how does exactly the electromagnetic navigation system work? There is an electromagnetic field transmitter which defines the surgical volume. Uh, then you need to uh, implant a reference transmitter on a uh, spinous process of the patient close to the uh, surgical area. And then you need a calibration grid to match the preoperative CT scan anatomical landmarks uh, to uh, the same landmarks on uh, AP and lateral fluoroscopic images, but then you can uh, perform a real-time navigation of each instrument on AP and lateral fluoroscopic images. This is an example published uh, by a Chinese group from the Guangzhou University in uh, 2020. What is uh, the future? Uh, probably that uh, robotics will help. Uh, there's little described in the literature about uh, uh, hybrid systems uh, with uh, uh, cone beam navigation and uh, robotic uh, machines that uh, allow you uh, to uh, be more precise and eliminate uh, the uh, movements of the camera that the surgeon could have. But this needs uh, more development uh, in the future. <clears throat> Uh, currently, so we have available for endoscopic surgery uh, two types of navigation, the three-dimensional cone beam CT uh, navigation versus uh, electromagnetic navigation. Uh, what we have is the ORM in our hospital. It allows for a three-dimensional real-time navigation. The electromagnetic navigation is a two-dimensional real-time navigation mainly. The ORM can be used in monoportal and uh, biportal uh, surgical techniques. The electromagnetic navigation is mainly developed for monoportal surgery. The arm needs an incision for the reference frame. The electromagnetic navigation is uh, the insertion uh, of a percutaneous spinous tracker. The arm needs a pre-procedure CT scan, which can be done in the operating room. The electromagnetic navigation needs a pre-operative CT scan. Uh, done outside the operating room. The ORM is probably more expensive than electromagnetic systems and it's not always available. The ORM, uh, on the other hand, uh, does not have any electric uh, interference, which is the case with the electromagnetic systems where you cannot use uh, ferromagnetic uh, instruments. So this is uh, uh, what's available currently for navigation. And uh, the main advantage that I found uh, with navigation in endoscopic procedure is uh, the improvement of the learning curve. But uh, this will need uh, some more development, especially for biportal techniques, which are gaining popularity in Europe. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, have a good day. So uh, now it's a pleasure to uh to uh, ask uh, Dr. Marjorie Rue uh, to do next presentation. She is from uh, Bordeaux, from Endoscopic, Endoscopic uh, Spine Center of Bordeaux in Sport Clinic. The uh, topics of this presentation will be uh, feedback of endospine, the, the stordo technique. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, you hear me, Maxime, it's okay? It's okay. it's okay. Okay. I am very happy to have been invited by you mostly, but uh, very nice. And I thank you all the team uh, for this uh, great organization. Uh, I am a neurosurgeon with a, a training in brain and pituitary uh, endoscopic uh, surgery. And I've came to endoscopy a few years ago after my meeting with Dr. Uh, Destando. Uh, mm -hmm. He's retired now and uh, created an endoscopic tool. Uh, it's called the endospine. And this tool uh, gives me a practical way to operate it on spine and make easier uh, the patient's recovery. I have visited uh, Dr. Shalali 
And uh, it was very nice and refreshing to see uh, how endoscopic open up uh, the surgical practice. And I will uh, present you my own experience uh, with the endospine. And uh, it's mostly to enlarge the landscapes of uh, endoscopic possibilities. Um, since uh, 2016, uh, I have done, um, I think, more than um, 2,500 procedures. And Excuse I will me. resume you. Excuse me, the slides are not going. Yeah, it's the presentations, that's why. Okay. Uh, sure, sure. And the way from the beginner uh, to, uh, to master. So let's begin. Uh, with the endospine, you can have a um, large bunch of indications, all of discal herniation. Uh, the lumbar stenosis uh, and uh, the recurrent disc herniation. You uh, have the tools. There is a speculum and introductor in the picture at the top. Um, and, uh, at the bottom, it's uh, uh, the tool with uh, three uh, channels, one for your endoscope, one for the section, and one for all the other tools. You have also a retractor nerve, nerve retractor. All you need, you need is that box with all the tools and the coagulation um, punch and uh, the cable, so on, uh, the endospine and um, the video column. So uh, in the picture above, you have uh, the system with uh, in which you can use your both hands. And after uh, many years, you, oh, you can improve, I think like in the UBE, uh, your movements and each movement in your teams. So you gain times, time. For example, for L5, S1 disc herniation, so it's a, a classical procedure. Um, at the beginning, it was uh, whew, more than one hour and a half uh, when I began the endoscopic uh, procedure, and now it's less than 40 minutes. So uh, on uh, the lumbar stenosis, it was two and sometimes three hours with a very uh, fat patient. Uh, now it's less than one hour and the technique is a, a over the top technique. Uh, and that's my preferred surgery is the articular cyst and uh, in, uh, with a L4, L5 cyst, cyst is I think one hour and a uh, half procedure uh, time for the whole procedure. Uh, so you have some advantage like in the other techniques uh, in, the, in the endospines, uh, the advantages are you are using your both hands, one on the suction, the other it's uh, for the dissector, the punches and so. Uh, there's no irrigation necessary um, and you have the same materials for all your procedures. Um, so what does it look like? It's like this. Uh, you have a device to uh, check on your uh, vertebral level with uh, the X-rays. After I always check, I'm a checker person, so always X-ray and I check the level at the beginning of the procedure and after when I am in an endoscopic way. Uh, the first step you made uh, lateral uh, two to three centimeters incision lateral to the spine process, spinous process, and you put your speculum and a retractor for the muscles. You remove the, all the muscles that's in your way, and uh, you see there's no irrigation. That's the difference be between the two, uh, the two types of endoscopic techniques. Uh, you are, um, you can use your regular uh, punch of, uh, for the coagulation. 
uh, you see This is the endoscopic part. Uh, you see I'm using in my left hand uh, section. In the right hand is the coagula coagulation uh, punch. Uh, you have the video column in face of you. Um, after it's a dissection um, time, like in all, all techniques, it's quite mobile. You have the endoscope just over there. After you have uh, all the classic instruments, instrumentation uh, you, you always have uh, in uh, your OR. So the Carison punch, uh, all other um, punches. This is your uh, surgical view. You see you have the carison just over there. You put your finger on the tool, so um, it helps to not uh, go too deeper uh, and make some vessels uh, lesion. You can move the device. So it's okay for left and um, right hand. Always the finger to secure the gesture. The section and you move uh, one, uh, then another two. Not the same uh, at the same time. Okay, you have your eyes on uh, the screen. It's mobile, I've already said that. So it's quite uh, comfortable. And always you using your both hands. Okay, I'm using a uh, high speed drill. Uh, so it's uh, quicker and it's uh, comfortable to remove uh, your bone, uh, especially for the lumbar stenosis, the bilateral uh, lumbar stenosis, when you are uh, drilling the spinous process. Okay, that's the end of the, this type of surgery. So two and three centimeters uh, technique, uh, uh, suture, sorry. And after you, uh, the patient go back, goes back in the bed. by rolling, uh, this is, uh, sorry. This is um, a capture of the screen. You have the dura at the top. 
the right nerve root, and you see now it's uh, clearly decompressed, and you see all the bony age. Um, so, like I used to say, it's uh, uh, the endospinal uh, or the UBU or all the endoscopic uh, technique. Uh, I told to the patient, keep calm and keep working with a smile. And after all, your patient will be very, very happy. So thank you for your attention and please uh, feel very welcome in our Spine Center. And again, thank you for everybody. So uh, thanks for uh, this uh, very interesting presentation. Now, uh, Professor Luek will take uh, the last uh, session of this uh, meeting. Uh, thank you, Maxime. Uh, so the, the last session, uh, we will uh, welcome the, the first uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Kim Ariel uh, from Hospital uh, Virgen del Rocho, Sevilla, Spain. And the topic is uh, UB in lumbar juxtafacet cyst. Welcome. Uh, hello, you listen hello. me? Yes, we listen to you and we can see you. You have to share your screen. Share to my screen. Uh, give me one second. I think this is my screen now. Okay. Now. Oh, you see my screen? Yes, clearly. Okay. Oh no, why it's not not working? This. Oh. Sorry. Okay, I'm in. Well, uh, thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be part of this uh, endoscopic community. Uh, there are a lot of uh, people that are starting to do it. In Europe, there are not many common to do a UBE. So we have to publicize this magnificent technique. Uh, so I'm going to talk some about um, our, our experience in Spain. I'm my name is Ariel Caen. I'm from Seville in the south of Spain. This is a wonderful city with uh, a lot of um, amazing... Uh, did you see my presentation now? Is, is yes, right? yes, we can see it, no problem. Okay. This is our city with a church, with an Arabic and, 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 and Catholic uh, uh, origins. Uh, in April, we have an, an amazing uh, city party. So you have to plan uh, to visit our, our city. Uh, let's talk to the UBE. I'm going to talk about specific lumbar juxtafacet cyst. Uh, we're talking sometimes of some of definition and classification, some tips and tricks for the surgery. And the end, we are, we are presenting some case. In 1885, Baker first described the formation of synovial cyst at a joint to a joint. The exact etiology of spinal synovial cysts is still unclear. When I made this revision several weeks ago, I found a lot of several numbers, synovial cysts, ganglion, flower ligament cysts, juxta synovial cysts, postural longitudinal ligament cysts, syphmos. There are many, many names for the same kind of cysts. So I, I think that we, we can divide in two main uh, um, Type. First of all, the choke synovial cyst that you can see uh, that originated and continued with the facet joint. There are continue, a continuation from the facet joint. And another group of, of cysts are non synovial cysts, are pseudo cysts. So the true synovial cysts, um, um, uh, you can see in the T2 MRI a, a communication between the joints and the cyst. 
sometimes are anteriorly, as you see in this uh, yeah, image, and push and get into the into the canal. I made this illustration for this uh, presentation. This is the disc, the transfer process, the spinal process, the flower ligaments and the facets. This is the root, and you can see how the the, the seeds push and get into the uh, canal and sometimes um, attach to, to the dura. Sometimes this cyst is going posteriorly. Maybe we can find more incidentally in this case, or the patient is going to complain about back pain. The cellular synovial cysts, really, they don't have a real uh, cells in, in the capsule, they're a collagen capsule. The name more, more frequently is the ganglion. They contain more mucinous contents and um, the location sometimes is uh, more posteriorly or anteriorly. So even if the true or non synovial cyst, you have to keep in mind three different epidemiologic aspects. First of all, we are going to see the sick tech of the life. So uh, older you are, more frequently you, you, you can have. The second is more a little more frequently in females. Uh, some authors talk about that it's half and half. And the first point is that L4, L5 is the five is the level of maximum mobility and more frequently. Um, so if if you understand that something um, developed in the facet, um, the the age, the the general change and the mobility are very very important factor. More than forty percent of the patient that we are going to see assist have some kind of responding. So. This inflammation started to uh, generate some uh, change. And the, controver the, 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 the really ideology is very controversial. Uh, there are talk about microtrauma, uh, herniation. Um, there, there are many, many, many theories, but uh, we don't know very nice what happened. Uh, the, the problem is that the, the contents of the cyst get into the channel, into the canal, central canal, and do a central canal stenosis. Sometimes this cyst, uh, that's, uh, as, as we see first, uh, have a wall with uh, cells, um, sometimes dissect the deeper and the superficial layer and don't uh, push only the dura, or, but, but the, the flower ligament. Um, some authors talk about that, for example, the ganglion the, is the late phase of the cyanobial cyst. Of, so with the time, the, uh, there are the, the connection, disconnection from the cyst, from the facet joint. So the ganglion may be a delaying uh, phase of, the, of, this, of this cyst. Even if the true or, 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 or non-true or, or cellular cyst, most of the patient maybe uh, we can find asymptomatic or incidentally. Uh, maybe back pain is very, very frequent in this patient, but when they complain the cyst, uh, push the, ner the, the existing nerve root. So 90% of the patients when are symptomatic have some uh, kinds of radicular pain. Um, more than 65% of the patients have some neurological symptoms, speci especially uh, claudication or, or, or some neurological deficit. There are many classifications. This is one of the last classification in 2020. Uh, Rosen's talk talk about type one when they in, uh, get into the uh, central canal and type three when they go to the foramen. Uh, type two is between foramen and, and central canal. I think this is the best uh, classification for me. Um, this uh, Australian group that has been published in 2018 uh, uh, talk about two main factors: how are the compromise of the central canal stenosis. Uh, and if the patient has some kind of spondy. So if the patient not have a spondy, it's not have a listesis, you can choose, uh, you can find grade one, grade two, or grade three. It depends of the, of the uh, percentage of canal compromise. And if you find a patient that has some kind of spondy, more than 50% uh, percent of the displacement, you can uh, talk about grade four when you are less than 50 uh, percent of the uh, central canal stenosis or more than 50 when you are in the grade five. So there are many treatment, many options. First of all, you can choose percutaneous, you can choose a decompression, or you can choose a fusion. When, uh, uh, when we talk uh, uh, percutaneous, of course, that's least invasive and the less 
risk from surgery. Uh, you can use a fluoroscopy or your CT guidelines, and uh, even you aspirate, you can inject some extra injection. The percutaneous treatment have three problem for, for uh, uh, this treatment. The low rate of thoracic relief uh, to the high rate of recurrence, more than 50% of the patient is going to have the same symptoms in the next six to nine months. And uh, often they, they need some time kind of repeat procedures. Uh, so uh, percutaneous treatment have a very, very uh, high rate of recurrence. This is the best treatment for me, the compression. You can do an open, you can do a minimal invasive, you can do endoscopy. This is the most effective treatment because uh, you are going to uh, have a relief of more than 90% of the patient. You have to keep in mind two uh, bad points from this surgery. First of all, you have more drug tears than in other uh, kinds of surgery. And the second, some, can, some of your patients, 6% of your patient is going to do or develop some uh, grades of instability in the future. So uh, some uh, authors, some uh, doctors uh, talk about that fusion is the first treatment. Uh, it's more aggressive. You need more longer hospitalization. More of these patients are older. So we uh, reserve the fusion for patients that are older. So the question is used to not fuse for this uh, cyst. This group tried to, to answer this question. If you know how to spawn the CC, make the decompression and follow your patient. And if you know how, if you, the, in the first uh, uh, approach of your patient, have your spondy, you in your first shoot, you have to, to fuse your patient. So 90% of effectiveness, the compression is the best. The question is, you have to do a minimal invasive surgery and open surgery. Fortunately, this uh, Cleveland group uh, uh, um, clarify this concept that in this systematic review and meta analysis, showed that mm, uh, tubular or endoscopic surgery are best treatment and are the best uh, option for this uh, synovial cyst. So let's go uh, to talk about some tips and tricks. Uh, remember, in the uh, biportal surgery, we need more AP view than in the open surgery. So you have to keep in mind that your patient is going to be in prone position. You need your AP and you need to un un understand where is your, your position in many, many times of your surgery. Remember, all your equipment is in front of you. Your setup in your R is going to change when you are moving from the open surgery or the microsurgery to the uh, endoscopic surgery. Biportal surgery has three different approach. Uh, for uh, lumbar cyst, you are 90% of the case use ipsilateral posture approach. Some patient maybe need to control lateral approach. It's an amazing approach to do in biportal surgery. And mm, I, I, I usually not use in, the, in, the, in this sense the far lateral approach. So um, getting to the uh, surgical details, you have to understand that sometimes the inflammation of the cyst push the dura and strongly attach. This inflammation change in the dura and the wall of the cyst sometimes uh, um, develop a strong attachment. And um, this is the, uh, maybe the, uh, the, the answer why this patient have more dural tears than uh, the other procedures in the neurosurgery or, or, or spine surgery. So in this animation, remember UBE, you can have your uh, endoscopic portal, uh, you have your uh, drill or your working portal, started to do a, a laminectomy with your, with your high-speed drill or arthroscope, then you can use the same instruments at open surgery. So you can choose your carison, remove your flower ligament. And when you start to dissect the, the, the cyst, you have to keep in mind this uh, strongly attached to the dura. So uh, sometimes if you remove more than 50% of the uh, wall, uh, you can uh, uh, resolve the problem and reduce your, your drug tears or, or, or your complications. Let's see some case. This is our first case, 66 years old female, uh, the right radicular pain with a neurologic complication. In, in the left part of your screen, you can see that this patient not have a spondy, 
there are a bit cyst with more than 15% of the uh, severe can central canal stenosis. We perform an UBE L45 uh, posterior approach. This is the video. This is, we are in the right side. So right is your prior port, left is your caudal, and in the super part of your brain is the middle line. Um, the UV is an amazing technique, gives your eyes very near to the target. Look, we can see the cortical and the uh, cancellor bone. We can use the same instrument that microsurgery, and uh, you can detach and resolve most of the lumbar pathologies. In this case, uh, remember that this patient have a, a very degenerative change, so we expected that they are going to have a very hypertrophic uh, flower ligament. I try to find the cyst. I see the, uh, the, um, the epidural fat, try to, to remove and to decompress the lateral resistance of this patient. I am not feel very comfortable and concerning about the dura in this case. So I try to uh, push, look at this. This is the floating, the content of the cyst. Uh, the content of the cyst is starting to float in the, in the, in the surgical view. So we are now dissecting and trying to separate from the parts of the dura that are strongly attached. Again, I try to, oh, again, more contents of the cyst. So I decide to open more flower ligament and remove the postural wall of this cyst. Again, I, we, are, we, we open all the cysts. This is all the contained we are now seeing. In this case, I tried to detach the wall of the cyst with the dura. Now I'm trying to remove part of the flower ligament. This is the strongly attached the dura to the, to the wall of the cyst. So I aborted, I stopped the surgery more than 50% of the cyst is, is uh, removing. We decompress all the lateral recess and the patient go home the same day. This is the second case, more younger patient. They are uh, a 54 years old female with a, a left L4 radiculopathy with a very important neurologic claudication. Uh, this patient has a left synovial cyst with a severe, severe lumbar uh, central canal stenosis, no spondy again. So we do our working portal in the inferior part. We uh, use the dilators. Uh, then the endoscopic portal, we only two step of the is enough. The triangulation in the, in the spinolaminal angle, this is the rule. In your five minutes, you have to find the spinolaminal angle. Now we are detaching some parts that are in the between the multifidus fasciculus of musk. This is the radio frequency probe, and we are detaching some of muscle and started to use the same drills and the same instrument that we, we can use in the microsurgery. We started to drill the inferior edge of the uh, L4 lamina. We are in the left side, remember, left cranial, right caudal, and superior part of the screen is your middle line. We uh, drill the uh, part of the uh, base of the spinal process. Now we are open the, the lateral recess. Now we're dis dissecting the, the flower lamin for the other side. So we can put the endoscope and do an over the job decompression. We're disinserting the, the inferior edge of the, of the flower lamin. And now we're detachment for the superior articular process. So the, 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 the final target is that our flower lamin are floating in our, in our uh, surgical view. Now we feel comfortable to detach the, the cyst if uh, it's very uh, strongly attached. Now we are um, detaching all the um, epidural fat. We are retracting the, 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 all the, uh, and removing the fabric ligaments. In this, in this case, the cyst is not a um, good country. They are very strong uh, wall attaching to the dura. We are lucky in this case, we don't uh, have any problem. And finally, 